Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm extremely sorry we are starting a little bit late because of our uh, traffic condition in Bangalore. <laughs> okay, few people still there on their way, so we'll not wait. We'll start our session. Uh, on behalf of uh, Wadwani Foundation and NEN, first of all, a very warm Happy New Year to all of you. If it has been said, I mean, it is very popularly uh, said that if you want to grow, then definitely you have to push yourself and you have to come out your comfort zone. So when you when I'm saying your comfort zone, definitely it is not that running your day to day business, you are in that comfort zone. But yes, you are tuned your all the processes systems are in place. If you want to go to the next level, you imagine when you have started your business and where you are right now, there is a certain difference and you have made that as per your understanding, learning, unlearning everything. But now you want to go to the next level. Now, Tools for Growth, we are here. The person uh, who is going to lead the session uh, today, the entire day, is uh, who is going to spend the entire day and who is going to give you all sort of tools and techniques, the right tools and techniques and proven tools and techniques on uh, Tools for Growth is uh, Dr. Rajiv Roy. It's really, really uh, great, uh, Rajiv, to get you here because it's difficult to get him. <laughs> so thank you very much. And now I'll hand it over to Rajiv. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chandan. Uh, morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the program. And as usual, Chandan has always done a bad job by overselling me all the time. So uh, we'll bring it down to earth in just a while. We are here for the day. And uh, this is going to be about tools for growth, obviously. Uh, before we start off, I would like to set some expectations in what we are going to be doing over this one day, how we are going to be doing it, and how you need to take things forward. Uh, there are some things which um, I'm sure are going to meet your expectations. Uh, one of the biggest things, of course, is there are too many people in the room. And when I say too many, more than one is too many always. So each one of you needs a solution or needs uh, be, uh, their problems being addressed on an individual basis. There are some things which can be addressed in a group and we'll do that over here. But I'm sure each of you has issues, challenges which are very much personal in nature, which are true only for your business and not true for anybody else's business over here. So please don't mind, raise those issues. Sometimes you'll figure out that no, that's not so. Actually the problems I have are problems being shared by others also. And uh, yes, uh, I think culturally we have been attuned to not talking about our problems in an open forum. But um, let's try to break that as much as we can. I mean, if you discuss your problem amongst other people who are going through similar problems, the likelihood of you finding a joint solution really goes up a lot. Um, I will give you a little bit about uh, what and how we are going to do things today. I was an entrepreneur for about 10 years. And for the next 10 years, um, I have been an academician, a mentor, and an entrepreneurship development professional in various avatars. Uh, when I became an ac academician, uh, most of my entrepreneur friends said that, what are you doing? Entrepreneurship can never be taught. And so that's a long conversation. We can have that later. Uh, but all academicians always looked at me as an entrepreneur. I don't know what this entrepreneur is doing over here. So what I have found out is because of this gap between these two communities, what we have not figured out is that there are a lot of tools, there are a lot of frameworks, there are a lot of theories which have actually been taken from practice. And there has never been a going back to practice for all these theories. They have remained in books and practitioners have actually not taken it up after that. There is a lot of use of these tools and theories which I, I think a lot of us as entrepreneurs can actually make use of it. So my attempt over here is to present those things. Here we'll be talking about certain frameworks certain ways of looking at things which are going to help you in your growth journey. That is what the focus is over here. So we'll be not doing a five point review of Trello versus uh, Basecamp. It's interactive. The problems are with you, the issues are yours, the opportunities are yours, and believe me, you know more about it than anybody else. So you will have to probably, what I'm going to do over here is I'm just giving you a framework in which you organize your thoughts. Very rarely would there be any additional input from me. So it is interactive. You have to learn from yourself and you have to learn from your peer sitting next to you and probably even those sitting in the next table from you. 
So you have to make sure that you are able to discuss your issues and everything very frankly. Need not tell you, growth is a challenge. If you look at even high growth industries, you will be very hard pressed to find organizations which have grown. I mean, there is a thought now that of course, the software story, the software services story is more or less plateaued out now, but it's been a long time since we had an Indian company hit a billion dollars and hit a billion dollars without having a um, billion dollars in revenue without actually having taken a lot of uh, other companies on board by acquiring them or probably moving the offices outside. 8% um, is the growth of the economy, can be debated, it's probably a little bit more right now. Uh, but the surprising thing is 84% of the enterprises in the private sector are actually growing at a pace which is lower than the pace of the economy. So you have the small set of enterprises who have probably figured out how to grow and the rest of the enterprises are facing a lot of problem. Now the average company only succeeds around 25% of the time when they try out something new, a new initiative. So we'll have to take that into account and there are various ways in which we'll take that into account when we are making our growth plans. Um, just a thought over here, whenever we talk about ventures, whenever we talk about the ecosystem talking about ventures, the focus is always about survival, make sure that you survive and uh, growth almost gets neglected all the time. But what I have also seen is sometimes growth is essential for survival. The way we are existing in a lot of markets, unless you have a certain amount of growth, survival comes into play um, as a very big iffy thing. So this is uh, broadly what we are going to be doing. Also, uh, just a break up, just to give you an idea of what exactly is happening in the market out there, 31% of the enterprises uh, surveyed. This is uh, enterprises which have been around for at least three years. 31% of them are actually in danger of going down. They have a degrowth which is more than minus 10%. So they are actually going down very seriously. 18% are those which are looking at a degrowth of anywhere between a minus 10% and minus 1%. Another 14% are those which are growing at a pace which is going to be somewhere between 1 to 5 percent. The reason why there are so many over here is for a lot of banking reasons, there are people who uh, end up padding up their balance sheet, make sure they have some amount of profit so the bank doesn't come knocking on their doors immediately. So there might be actually a lot of these enterprises which are actually in the 18 percent and not declaring so. Uh, 21 percent of the enterprises are actually anywhere between let's say 5 to 10 percent and uh, it's only 16 percent of the enterprises which are growing at a rate which is more than that of the economy which is around nine and a half percent right now. So just thought I'll give you this picture that uh, growth is a challenge not just for you, Go growth is a challenge across industry, across sectors and probably across vintages if I may use the word of different enterprises. So these challenges exist and uh, one has to come to terms with it. So before I uh, get into anything, um, let's spend a little bit of time in getting to know you. Um, just I would like to know your name, your enterprise and what you are into. There will be la la many more opportunities where we get into the specifics of what you will be doing. But right now let's start off with your name, your enterprise and what is it that the business you are engaged in. We'll start with you. Good morning, I'm Karthik. Uh, I'm, I'm founder at Amber Root uh, Systems. Uh, we do uh, solar power electronics, actually solar chargers and devices to add solar to uh, in variety of cases. Right? Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Abhiman. I'm co-founder at Green Nerd Solutions Private Limited. So we build uh, products for clean tech sector, currently focused more on waste management. Hi, good morning. I'm Nidish, uh, again from Green Nerds, so same business line. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Vijeta Shastri. I'm from Hotel Simply. What we do is we work very closely with aggregators and with budget hotels to provide them any solutions in terms of software or channel manager booking engine, which helps them to get revenue. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Shobhik Pal. I'm the co-founder of Shristi. We focus mainly on Aadhaar-based authentication 
but uh, in the future we also have a micro atm using aadhar in the pipeline good morning i am sunil um, i head uh, global pest control services i am into pest control business i'm uh, founder of srishti sdm so we are in the esdm domain as you rightly said we work with the other best various solutions hi morning my name is ashwin dange uh, we run a startup called as uh, digipulse which is into customer satisfaction and management we measure customer satisfaction uh, across businesses and uh, we help businesses improve uh, the number as well hi i am shri i am from mahiti we provide technology for those who are looking at social change uh, good morning uh, my name is kiran i am from uh, i am the founder of beset enterprises we are into uh b2b uh, and b2c travel training and events uh, and we're also considering getting into mobile app uh, space renewable energy and uh, digital marketing uh, good morning i am sindhu founder of infotran and uh, i provide erp solutions for msmes uh yeah hi i am sheetal i am co-founder of this column minds ad ventures uh, private limited basically we do this you know uh, completely k 1 to 12 training supplementary training in science and uh, uh, mathematics national and international olympiads that's what we did it hi i am anandhi i'm part of an organization called silre which works with children providing different uh, learning experiences outside school i am rajshekar uh, i'm the founder of apnacomplex.com uh, which is a erp platform for apartment and commercial complex management hi i'm ankit uh, co-founder of willu.com it's a one stop shop for all craft related uh, products workshops uh, supplies Uh, hi my name is Syed and Syed Ahmed and I'm running a company co-founder of a company called E Square Info Solutions and we are into services where we provide portal application development services we worked with the government of India government of Malaysia and many other US based companies in terms of building web applications like intranet and travel management and multiple other services and all of that in addition we've recently uh, you know developed e-commerce uh, portal which is a e-commerce product actually wherein retailers can go ahead and build their own online shopping cart in about 5 to 10 minutes so that's going to be it's in the last stage of uh, you know getting on to be launched thanks hello good morning my name is ashish agarwal i run a company called digital harbor we are into software products for us healthcare i think we have a little bit of an idea about everybody of course most of you know the nen team uh, we'll get a lot of chance to meet them as time goes on and um, we'll quickly get into the thick of things in terms of what are the frameworks that we are going to use and how we are going to be using them uh, just to give you an overview of what we are doing um, in the first half we'll be looking at some commonly used frameworks when we are looking at growth but we are going to look at it a little differently i've been using these for last 10 years when i'm dealing with students who have just started off also when i'm dealing with entrepreneurs who have been around for about 10 15 years and a lot of people in between also so we'll be looking at it in a little different manner and we'll also be integrating all these frameworks you don't have too much of time to use uh, let's say one full day on one framework so we'll be looking at a lot of different frameworks and see how they come together uh, the second half of the day we'll spend in how do you end up coming up with new products and services uh, in the first half of the day we'll establish the need for you to come up with new products and services in the second half of the day we'll do that and uh, obviously if you have any doubts any questions please raise your hands and interrupt interrupt me at that moment itself uh because i'm sure if you have a doubt there'll be seven other people in the room who will also have the doubt so please don't worry about it interrupt me at any point of time in case i am actually explaining it i'll let you know that hold on to the thought i'll come back to it later but in most cases you're more than welcome to interrupt me at any point of time okay uh so what are the frameworks we're going to be doing over here so there are four frameworks we'll use uh, we'll use the ansof matrix to look at what are basically the different avenues of growing So the ANSOF matrix is probably uh, one of the basic material that you need to look at growth. It's a very very convenient tool for you to classify the growth opportunities that you have with you. We'll have a short look at that. Again, it's iterative. There are four frameworks we'll be using in the morning, and we keep on going back and forth between the frameworks also. So once you finish with the framework, doesn't mean you throw it in the dustbin. You have to revisit it after a while also. The next one we'll do is adjacency mapping when we look at um, how do you end up finding out what are the most important or the most interesting adjacencies that you have with you right now. Uh then we look at identifying the core in terms of your core business as well as your competencies. Core competency has been a very misused word. 
Um, I have a soft corner for it because one, uh, the word itself came out from one of my profs and probably the first management jargon to have emerged from somebody who is uh, part of this subcontinent. So I have a soft corner for that and that it is very useful when you are looking at businesses. And then we'll tie in all these with what is called the lean approach. The lean approach has been used primarily for looking at startups in a very early stage. But the entire framework is so apt for a growing organization, it's a wonder why it's not used more for those organizations which have gone beyond the stage of figuring out whether they need to survive or not, and those which are growing a lot like all of you over here. Okay, so uh, quickly into the ANSOFT matrix. Um, I put in a lot of words over here because if I don't put in the words over here, it's a very simple thing, so you won't get confused. So just hoping that I have enough words over here so it confuses you in terms of what it is all about. A very simple thing, you look at opportunities along two different parameters, whether you are going into a new or you are existing with your old market or rather you are continuing with the old market or whether you are coming up with a new product or continuing with an existing product. So based on how you are doing on these two parameters, there are four kinds of opportunities that you have with you. The first one is market penetration. When you look at your existing product and your existing market and you try to sell more to the same people of the same product that you have been selling. Different ways of doing it, it is probably one of the few things where you don't need to do too many things which are different but you need to reorganize a lot of what you have been doing so far. Uh, this is the one which leverages on your competencies, existing competencies far more than the other ones that we are looking at. Uh, the next one is market development. When you are looking at new territories, sometimes new segments in the same geographical territory, uh, one of the advantages over here is suppose you have a great product. You know that the product is very good and it can go on to a lot of other segments. This is the strategy you end up using. You do end up leveraging some of your existing competencies and capabilities, but maybe you need to develop some new ones also. I'm not saying that you don't need to develop new competencies uh, if you're going to stick to your existing market with existing products, but the need to do so over here is a little bit more. Uh, the third one we look at is product development. When you know your market extremely well, you have a huge amount of connect with your existing market and you know that whatever new product you can come out with is likely to have a huge fit with the market because of your extended understanding of your current market. That is when you use this. Um, I won't recommend a completely unrelated diversification where you come up with a new product for an entirely new market. Um, but there are times when this is warranted. There are times you come up with an opportunity which might be completely uncorrelated to what you are doing right now and you have to make use of it. Not giving you any examples right now to uh, bias exactly how you should be going ahead with it, but we will be discussing a lot of examples as we go along just a little further. This is one of the most simple ones. I just thought I will get you started off with this and then we'll uh, increase our level of complexity. Any questions at this stage before I hand out um, the answer of matrix for you to have the first round of fill up? Okay, um, we'll be handing you a set of frameworks. Um, the one which is right at the last is the answer of matrix. So have a look at that and right now, from the top of your mind, fill out what might be the top three opportunities on in each of these boxes into those boxes, right? Okay, well, one more thing about the approaches. This is just a one day workshop. The objective over here is to make sure you know what these frameworks are and how do you end up using these frameworks. But uh, it's going to be very unlikely that you actually come up with something which is completely usable at the end of the day. But the idea certainly is that at least you know these frameworks so that you can go back and rework at this and at a later point of time, maybe in a few days time, you are actually able to come up with an opportunity which suits your circumstances. So do this as an exercise in which you are familiarizing yourself with the frameworks. It will be great if you can actually come across uh, classifying the opportunities or evaluating the opportunities in a manner which is useful for you. But what the objective really is of the workshop is that you know how to use these frameworks at a later point of time also. So this is consolidation. 
Then you have market penetration. Basically, you have to sell more of the same stuff to your existing customer or you have to find more customers within your existing market. Okay, so what we do is, you look at uh, market development to look at what exactly are the new markets that you can go to with your existing products. So list out the markets that you can go to with your existing products. Let's say you operate geographically in Karnataka or you operate geographically in Bangalore. So the new market you can probably go to might be a Kerala, might be a Maharashtra, can be a Calcutta, whatever are the new markets that you look at geographically. Let us say you operate in the B2B space and you concentrate on software services firms. When you're looking at product development, let's say you have a very good connect with your existing markets, right? You're doing a great job of selling to MSME. What you're selling now is an ERP product. Now, if you want to sell something else, it can be a market intelligence product also. So once you have a very good connect with your existing customers, you have to look at what are these other products that I can sell to the same customers. So that is what I'm looking for when you're looking at the product development. Diversification. You are around in this ecosystem, you are hearing a lot of things of what others are doing. You know there are some opportunities out there. Unfortunately, your business right now has nothing to do with those opportunities. So are there any unrelated opportunities that you think are going to be a great deal for your business? For example, if you are in the business of uh, HR services and here in Bangalore and you see a lot of people who are actually uh, moving in and out of the city, somehow you feel that, okay, I think what I need to do is um, I really don't enjoy what, I don't think there's a great opportunity in what I'm doing right now. What there is a great opportunity in doing is opening up another biryani joint, which is seafood biryani or something like that. That is unrelated diversification. So this is the third one. When I'm talking about market penetration, that becomes a little more difficult. We are talking about being in the same market. So what are the things you have to do to be a little more sales worthy in your existing market? New channels can be one. New sub-segments can be another. So you're looking at a certain sub-segment, but you think that there's another sub-segment in the market which you can do. Maybe a little tweaks in what else you are doing in terms of uh, partnering with a few organizations and then expanding your reach within the same, uh, same market. So those little tweaks are what you're going to mention over here. So the three biggest opportunity in each, I would like you to map out. Um, do we have a fair idea? Yeah, please. Um, there are various ways you can define it. Top line, bottom line in terms of revenue. Uh, number of employees can be another measure of growth. Number of territories you are in can be another measure of growth. Number of customers going up without a growth in top line in some ways can also be growth. And the opposite, where the spent of each customer going up without you actually increasing the number of customers can also be growth. I will not restrict any of these definitions over here. Uh, usually, the main measures of growth are going to be your top line and it is going to be the number of employees. But I would not like you to restrict yourself to these two measures. If you think it is appropriate for you to measure growth in any other way, and I'll be very happy if you measure growth in terms of bottom line. Very few people do that, but I'll be very happy in, in case you end up doing that. I think that's the way to go about it. I mean, I think bottom line is the only thing which counts. Everything else is just... Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is what counts. Everything else is just for the accountants and for the government to figure out what we are, uh, we are up to. But bottom line is the only thing which counts. So I'll be very happy if you measure your growth in that. But whatever are the measures that suit your purposes, I'm fine with it. And you should be fine with it. Now, we go on to the next uh, model over here, which uh, the next framework over here, which is that of adjacencies. What do you understand when, you, when I talk about adjacencies? Anybody? Nearby, low hanging fruit, anything else? Things that 
things which can be added to your portfolio without much effort, something which is closely related to what we are doing. Yep. I think that about covers it. There are a lot of adjacencies. Most people think about adjacencies in a very limited way in terms of the markets or the products. But there are various ways in which you can look at adjacencies and I'll just show you some of those. So the main adjacencies that you can look at are these six. I'll start with the easiest, it is geography. So you look at a geographical adjacency. I was recently in Siliguri and that is one place where they have looked at uh, geographical adjacency in a very, very amazing way. So Siliguri, and we have some people here who are from Siliguri who will understand what I'm saying also. Um, it's in a great geographical place. If you want to go anywhere to the seven sister states and to Sikkim, so eight states out of 29 in India, if you're going anywhere on ground, you have to pass through Siliguri. That is one adjacency they have been able to exploit. North of Bangladesh, the road route which goes into the north of Bangladesh is also through Siliguri. If you're going into Bhutan, unless you're taking the China route, again it is Siliguri. Eastern uh, half of Nepal is again Siliguri. A lot of uh, northern Bihar, northeastern Bihar is again through Siliguri. So that as a community, as a business community, they have been able to exploit those geographical adjacencies very well. Uh, we look at Zomato, which has done more or less the same thing, largely through acquisitions, where they have looked at what are the other countries that they can expand into, which are culturally similar to what they have been doing in India, which can accept the product. So they have made some acquisitions. They have also made some organic growth into new, into new countries. Then, of course, uh, the other adjacency we look at are customer segments. Um, Snapdeal has been sort of losing out to Amazon and Flipkart in a variety of ways. Again, amongst these players, uh, probably Snapdeal is the one which has been most active in making a lot of acquisitions. And some of those acquisitions have been an attempt to get into these new adjacent segments. So exclusively uh, .in is again an uh, acquisition they made to get into the higher end of, this, um, of the fashion segment, sort of uh, trying to compete against the LED files of the world also. And uh, that has been sort of successful, not all that much, but it is an attempt for them to actually get into that segment. Uh, channels, one of the biggest examples I can quote right now is the omnipresent Baba Ramdev. Um, now you find it even in Big Bazaar, in addition to being the only FMCG player of that size who have their own dedicated range of, uh, range of retailers, which was this huge innovation that they came up with. They also are selling through other retailers now, particularly through chain stores like uh, Big Bazaar. Products and services. Uh, Stag is one example which I always quote. Um, there are a lot of other such people who have figured out a way of making new products and services for your existing customer. Any of you have heard uh, Stag? Please don't tell me Royal Stag. I know I'm in the town where th that's what comes up. But uh, any of you have heard about the brand Stag? <laughs> Not really. Okay. Um, Walk into any hall where you have a TT game going on. The table is going to be stagged, right? So now some of you recall having seen that brand, right? But you'll be surprised. Those tables they have over there are not more than 25% of the revenues they have. The single biggest earner for them has actually been t-shirts. So they sell t-shirts. Now how many in this room have actually seen people wearing stagged t-shirts? None. So those tag t-shirts are worn almost exclusively by those people who play table tennis and lots of it. So they have concentrated on that segment. They have found out that stag is almost an omnipresent brand when it comes to table tennis and they stick to that. So they have done a great job of selling t-shirts, shorts, track suits, shoes and only to TT players. And this is a very, very big market for them. I'll give you some more examples. Uh, again, I'll be using some sports examples. Have any of you heard of a brand called Foodjoy? Exactly. It's, it is a leader in its brand. It fought off competition from Nike and Reebok for many, many years. Uh, it has a turnover in multiple hundred million dollars and uh, it sells primarily sports, uh, it sells primarily golf shoes. It makes the best golf shoes in the world and Nike uh, and Adidas have not been able to make a foray into this. 
actually Adidas had to buy its single biggest competitor, which was TaylorMade, before they could actually make a dent in the market. So here again, we are looking at somebody who has a huge, um, you can say, hold over the small market. So from making shoes, they have actually gone on to making clothes because they know the segment extremely well. So we are looking at new products that you can sell to your existing segment. Many have actually used a similar, in the same space, many have used a similar strategy to look for new customer segments because they have found out the importance of having a customer segment which is completely loyal to you. So you have brands again in sports like high tech who were into uh, uh, badminton shoes. They got a lot of competition from leaning. So now they have actually gone into hiking shoes. So the products you find in the Indian market, which are high tech shoes, are actually hiking shoes. You don't find too much of the badminton products over here. In Europe, they are more well known for their badminton products. Leaning again has gone from um, a huge concentration on uh, gymnastics to, to now being almost exclusively a badminton brand. They are trying to expand into, again, another segment, which is basketball, but they have not been very successful in that. But this is the way they have been looking for new segments. Uh, processes is also an adjacency. Uh, American Airlines had a great booking software and then they have gone ahead and made Sabre out of it. And Sabre, as we know, is one of the most successful online booking platforms, or rather backends, which is used by most of the online bookers. And they have done a they made a huge success of it. DBS. Basically, they had a bunch of diamond mines. They found out that the retailers and the distributors have no idea of how to drive up the value of diamonds. So they have gone forward in the value chain, created huge marketing campaigns around diamonds. Diamonds are forever is actually a marketing campaign by De Beers. Um, and they control the diamond market, organized diamond market about 65%. At one point of time, it used to be closer to 90% of the world's organized diamond trade used to be De Beers. And that was a result of their forward integration. They have gone into agreements with governments, whether it is Botswana or it is Angola. Uh, they have also gone into a lot of uh, retail-based acquisitions, and uh, they control the flow of diamonds. For every, di every five diamonds that are actually mined out, only two get cut, cut and polished, and out of those two, only one actually gets sold. The other is kept in this huge vault they have somewhere in uh, London. So these are the adjacencies, and uh, you have to see how exactly these adjacencies can be used. Um, what I would like you to do is uh, go into the first one now and look at what are the most potential adjacencies of your existing business. So you have, a, uh, before you get into the adjacencies, you have to identify what exactly it is that you do. So let us say you are currently selling um, waste management products and you are selling to um, government entities based in Karnataka. So that is your core right now, for now. I will we'll be redefining the core in just a while, but uh, that is your core now. So what are the immediate adjacencies that you have on all of these five, on all of these six? It's a little easier for you to do the first four. It's a little more difficult for you to do the uh, final two, not in terms of putting it down on paper. Putting it down on paper, anybody will be able to do it. But when you're actually implementing it, a value chain adjacency is far more difficult to engineer than, let us say, a geographical uh, adjacency. Somebody selling ice cream in uh, Uttar Pradesh can very easily go to Delhi and sell ice cream. But somebody selling ice cream, getting into the trade of uh, dried milk products is going to be far more difficult. Right? or getting into the business of cream is going to be far more difficult. So the value chain adjacency is a little more difficult to implement. It is actually in uh, vaguely in the order of increasing difficulty of implementation. Okay. You know, there's something else which is probably the opposite of an adjacency, which also we should be talking about. The flip of adjacency is actually the core. And by core, I do not mean all that you're doing right now. So if you look at that one box, which is in the first column where, let's say, um, there is some space over there and I would like you to use that space to put in what you think is the core. What exactly is it that you are doing right now, which you are doing extremely well? So let us say, for example, you are selling in uh, Bangalore and you are selling clothes. You are selling clothes for women, but you are doing very well in the segment, which is, let's say, 35 to 45. 
So your core is not women based in Bangalore, but but it is that age group of 35 to 45, which is your core. So where is it that your performance is the best? What is it that you do extremely well? That is what you put down as the core on all of these six. So we'll take very quickly um, seven minutes and there's only one core. If you are defining a core, it has to be a single one. This is the basically the thing that you are doing extremely well. This is the segment that you're doing very well in. This is the product that you're doing very well in. Most of you will have multiple products or services. You'll have about 10 different products which you're trying to sell, but you'll find that there is one or two at most products which account for 80% of your profits. That is your core. Um, the next one I'm going to do is that on core competency. A very, very misunderstood concept. Uh, what do you understand when I say core competency? What are you best at? What are you best at? Beautiful. The key strengths, yes, exactly. You have actually got the concept right. This is exactly, yeah. What makes you unique? Very much there. In fact, uh, you have actually got it right, but uh, very strangely, a lot of businesses got it wrong. They use the concept of core competency to continue doing what they were doing. That is not what, is, uh, what core competency is all about. Core competency is about figuring out what is it that you do better than others and using that as your reason to grow, using that to create your blueprint for growth. So just to give you a definition of what uh, co-competency is, co-competency necessarily has three things. It is applicable across a large number of markets. That is one major thing. Second is that it gives you a competitive edge. It helps you give some benefit to the customer. And the third thing, the important thing over here is, it is a capability which is difficult for others to imitate. It is some capability which others can't come up with in, let's say, a week or so. They will need a lot of investment of time and effort from their end to actually come up with something like that. In the case of, uh, I'll give you some examples of how companies have identified the core competency. In the case of, uh, let us say, um, Honda. Honda t thinks of their core competency as the engine itself. So based on that core competencies, they have actually gone into a bunch of other things. Honda makes lawn mowers, Honda makes generators, Honda makes a bunch of things, but all of it is based around engines. So the capability to make engines is what is their core competency. If you similarly look at Shell, their core competency they have identified is looking at uh, discovery and recovery of oil. So all the businesses that they have built up is actually based on that. The retailing they have gone into is something that they are reluctantly there because they need to be there. But the rest of their business is completely that. So they have not got into diamonds, they have not got into iron ore because that is not where the core competency is. They have identified it as discovery and recovery of oil and that is what they have stuck to. So similarly, other organizations have defined it very differently. The power section in GE defines it as uh, energy and uh, coming up using, of, using technology to provide energy efficiently. So that is why they're in a bunch of things. You see them in oil and gas, you see them in thermal, you saw, see them in geothermal, you see them in uh, uh, all kinds of alternate energies, whether it is wind or it is uh, tidal or it is solar. The thing is, the reason they are there and they're there so in such a big way is because of the use of technology. The use of technology in these sub-segments is much more than the other sub-segments. And a long time back, they found out that their competitive advantage is through the use of technology, making sure that the technology can give them an edge over there. That is why they are there. Where is the value of the exactly. So the use of this is actually twofold. Number one, you know that this is the reason you are there in the market, so you better make sure that you do most of it in-house. You don't have too many other people trying to help you out with that in-house. You obviously have partners, that's a different thing. Now the other thing you do is, this is the one thing you do better than anybody else. So what else can you do as a basis of this? So when you go back to the answer of matrix and look at where exactly you are going to be expanding, if you look at the adjacencies and which of these adjacencies are the ones which are the most attractive for you, are actually the ones which are more in line with your core competencies. Now, if your core competency is um, retailing, then, and you are into retailing of clothes, 
So obviously the retailing of accessories is much more a core competency for, is much more a, a good expansion for you than getting into the manufacturing of clothes, which is also an adjacency for you. But how do you use the adjacency as a result of your core competency? You find out what exactly it is that you do better than most other people in the industry and use that in your blueprint of where exactly you have to go next. So there were 1600 pass outs from the IITs this year who decided to start their own enterprise. So there has been a huge change in the ecosystem. And this is the time when we are actually looking at a huge growth in the number of uh, entrepreneurs that are there. So the corollary to this is that a lot of them are going to fail. A lot more are going to fail now than they failed earlier. A lot of them are going to fail in the first stage of not being able to survive the first few years. And a lot more will fail in the second stage where they're actually not able to figure out how exactly to grow. So I think it is much more important that we have this kind of supporting ecosystem. And uh, believe me, the opportunities in the Indian market are so huge that what we might perceive as a culture of backbiting right now is going to completely go away when most entrepreneurs are going to realize that the biggest support system they have is other entrepreneurs in the same room as them. So I think this is happening to a huge extent. If something like this was organized about 20 years back, none of you would have been here because the concept of a support system did not exist. And in two, uh, and 2005, when NEN started, the first program which NEN conducted, um, there were just 15, no, actually I'll give you the right number. There were 17 identified entrepreneurship trainers, other than some government related trainers who really didn't know what they were doing. There were 17 identified entrepreneurship trainers in the country who knew about the problems and the issues facing the entrepreneurial ecosystem. The situation has changed a lot since then. People are not, um, uh, you know, people are able to find rights for themselves even after they become entrepreneurs. So things are uh, certainly on the upswing over here. So uh, it's a good situation that we are in. It's a great market opportunity, but it's not an easy one. And we need to figure out how to go about it. Um, you have a sheet over here where you can also map out your core competency. A little differently than we did it for the others, uh, now is when you will also use the core co competency to go into the other sheets that you have filled out earlier. First of all, just put down your core competencies. What do you think are your core competencies? If you have put down five ultimately, then there is something wrong with your way of how you understand what a core competency is. It's very difficult that you'll have more than one and it's very uh, largely impossible that you'll have three. It's quite uh, difficult to have three core competencies. But in order to identify what that one thing is, you might need to put down five. So what I have done over here is put down the five things that you think are the ones that you do better than anybody else. After you have identified and put down those, give yourself a score on one to five on these three parameters. Whether you think it is widely applicable, uh, whether you think it is, can be easily imitated or not, and whether it gives you, if it cannot be imitated easily, it's a five. If it can be easily imitated, it's a one. And how much of a competitive advantage does that give you? So put in those scores, and then we'll see how to take that forward from there. Okay. Absolutely. A very important one over here, there are individual competencies. Um, startup, not more than three or four people. That's the time when the individual competency matters far more than any other competency. And yes, put that down. Because it is going to be individual competency which is going to drive you from a figure of three employees to let's say a figure of about 25 to 30 employees. After that, other things are going to play. Okay. Can I share it with others, what you have put down over here? Okay. So uh, just to give you an example of how exactly the core competency is going to be mapped out. Uh, the three core competencies which are the starting list over here are relationship building, customer care, and educating the clients, right? So these are the three, uh, these are very, very market facing um, competencies. And I think it's a fair list over here. Now also, for example, when you look at, uh, look at something like relationship building, it's important across industries. And if that is one of the core competencies in terms of applicability, it is certainly going to be hugely applicable across places. But when you come to 
uh, imitability how easily can it be imitated by others in the market or others in, others in other markets also then there's a very high factor over there it can be easily imitated unless you have some very special way of taking care of uh, your relationship building it can be easily imitated but not that everybody can do it also so you give it a middling score you give it a score of around three in this case that is what it is there competitive advantage is it a big competitive advantage see uh, relationship building is a source of competitive advantage if done properly but in your case is it being done at a level which can give you a huge competitive advantage over others in terms of is some uh, how do you take a call on that do you have clients who are willing to pay you more just because your uh, uh, relationship building is good is it that because of your relationship building you have a higher repeat order in your industry than almost anybody else those are the kind of things that allow you to say that yes i think i have a great competitive advantage as far as my relationship building is concerned <coughs> okay have you all identified your core competencies okay now we go on to a small little exercise how many core competencies do you have by the way one four three you have thrown out two. How many of you have five? You have five left. Anybody else? You have five candidates. Okay. Those of you who have five or four candidates, get rid of one or two appropriately so that you come within three. Okay. Now, how do you use this? Go back to your earlier lists. Adjacencies as well as the ANSOF matrix. Right. These, the adjacencies and the ANSOF matrix gives you the universe of opportunities which you actually might be looking at right now, which are the natural opportunities for you. How do your core competencies play on those opportunities that you have? Okay, uh, mapping done to a large extent. Okay, uh, how many opportunities do you have which are well mapped to your core competencies? I'll just go for a number now. We'll discuss it uh, in a little more detail in a while. You have two. Two. You're mapping it now. Four opportunities. Eight opportunities. I think you are in a very well connected field. Ten. Excepting for the processes, everything else seems to be connected. Very good. Six. Six. Four. Seven. Eight you have. Okay. Four. Geography is the issue, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, 14. You'll have a lot of work to do in just a while. Um, okay, now um, we'll be at this stage for now. Um, there's a little bit about the lean methodology that uh, I want to uh, introduce to you before we take it on to the next level and try to see which of these opportunities and how do you exactly work on these opportunities. I want you to think about this short list of opportunities that you have with you. Uh, more than probably the fit with a lot of these other things that we are going to seek, a very important thing is it's fit with your own aspirations, your own uh, goals. Think about that a little bit. We'll go back to this exercise and see how it fits, up, uh, fits in with the other organizational parameters. But spend this time to think about how exactly these opportunities fit in with your own goals and aspirations. Okay? So we are suspending this uh, con uh, conversation for now. We'll get back to this uh, after lunch.